Hi, and welcome to Classical Stuff You Should Know, a podcast about classical education, old stuff, old books, the ancient world, and the not-so-ancient world, done by us, three guys who love it. Uh, my name is yeah. Graham Donaldson, and I am joined with Thomas Magby Hello. and AJ Hannenberg. Right here. And we podcast about, uh, oh my word, we do this. This is what we do. I just realized I was about to repeat everything I just <laughs> said. <laughs> just, and then we were going to get into an infinite do you, loop. Do you loop. get that habit when you teach where you say something and then you say it again because they probably didn't get it the first time? Yeah, I noticed myself repeating everything but, twice. Well, the thing is, especially when you teach that class three times a day, <sighs> you're like, did I say this already? They're like, yeah. You're like, oh, I'm sorry, kids. <laughs> do they normally point it out to you when you say it twice in class? Usually I will, it's not necessarily saying the same thing twice. It's I will say something and then instantly rephrase it another way hmm. because you didn't think a lot of time it. they won't yeah, yeah. get it the first time. Anyway, so based on the notes, we're doing what looks like like a, some sort of new Japanese video game. And mm-hmm. um, Kyridian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, All uh, your base. Or an expansion or an expansion of a current video game. Yes. Uh, I don't know, Final Fantasy 20 in Kyridian, Kyridian or something. Yeah. Oh, that sounds like an actual thing. That'd be fun. Yeah. Um, so we yeah. are doing the Enchiridion. It is a, if you're a fan of Adventure Time, it is the manual for how to be a hero. But if you're not a fan of Adventure Time, the cartoon? Mm-hmm. I don't Adventure know what you knew. You guys have never seen Adventure Time? No, I'm an no. adult. I'm an, I'm a, I'm a adult. Easy there, buddy. Oh, Easy. It is a, it is a classic <laughs> great cartoon. For, I'm, I'm just kidding. Wow. I'm, I'm sorry I made fun of your cartoons. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Dark Souls. <laughs> Dark Souls. <laughs> once again. Right. Even it. <laughs> Um, that was a that was a reference back to the the September AMA we just recorded. For those of you who are, aren't privy, aren't in the know, uh, yes, you the, can the, hear the them user on our question was who has the darkest soul, and that's not. And Graham won, I think, with a hands down, re- yeah. resounding. Okay, yeah. so yeah. we're talking about Epictetus and his Consider book, winning. the <laughs> the Enchiridion. So let's talk a little bit about who Epictetus was, and then we will get to the meat of the Enchiridion. So Epictetus was a fella born between 50 and 60 AD, I think somewhere in Phrygia, and then eventually he made his way all the way to Rome. We don't exactly know how he got there, but mm. when he got there, he was a slave. Was his name just Titus, and he did something amazing? And then he became Epic. Epictetus. Epictetus. <laughs> Epictetus. <laughs> and then, so he was a slave to ne- Emperor Nero's secretary, who oh. was a, oh. a, I think... Yeah, like another free man, but I'm not I'm I'm not too clear on the secretary's status, but while he was there, he was a slave. And while in that guy's service, he took courses with a fashionable stoic and everyone was so impressed with his engaging dynamic uh personality as he was doing things. Eventually, Wait, slaves could take classes? Apparently. Mm. I, I really think slavery was a different situation back yeah, then in Rome. Like it. And so he eventually became a free man. And then he started teaching philosophy on street corners and in the marketplace with very little success. <laughs> Just nobody was interested in the guy spouting out philosophy on the street corner. Well, that's, have you, that, do you listen to the guy on the Not subway? Yeah. Zero percent chance. Yeah. But I mean, even that he thought there was a chance of it. Yeah, like, yeah. I just feel like it's such a different world, mm-hmm. right? That there was a market for people who are like, I'm teaching philosophy. And people be like, oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> Which yeah. street corner will you oh. be on? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I I'll guess I'll listen. stop going to the bakery and sit down and listen to you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I just, whew, the D- very, D- different cultures, different right? Different times. Right. Different times. Is he the change my mind guy? Like on the, with the put it on a little table? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, man. I, I kind of hope so. That, that's probably more Diogenes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sure. <laughs> I could see Diogenes doing that. Yeah. Okay. So he was eventually exiled under the reign of Emperor Domitian, along with a bunch of other philosophers between the years of uh, 89 and 92 AD. And he went in his exile to a city named Nicopolis, clearly founded by Nick. <laughs> where he yeah. founded himself a school and his school gained such renown and he gained such renown as a stoic philosopher that Nicopolis became the place where Epictetus's school was Dang. more than anything else, right? Wow. That's, that's how his city got famous. Uh, there was another guy that was eventually consul um, named Flavius Arian and Flavius Arian came to the school probably to be between 123 and 126. At this point, Epictetus is... 60 some 70 some years old depending on when he was actually born and so epictetus is already an old man and flavius was enamored he loved this guy apparently epictetus was an extremely dynamic teacher and he would 
tailor his discourses to the needs of his and concerns of his students, right? Mm-hmm. And so he wasn't just up there and he would preach at you and then leave. He had a he had a wonderful back and forth. And Flavius was so enamored by this that he is the guy who actually recorded everything. So Epictetus's discourses are recorded by Flavius, okay. as is the Enchiridion. It is a sort of a collection of Epictetus's sayings and teachings taken in shorthand by Flavius hmm. while he was there. So it's like like lecture notes. Yep. Yeah, and I didn't know that shorthand was a thing back then. Mm-hmm. How how long has shorthand been around? Do you guys know? Probably a really long time. Do you know the answer? I have no oh, idea. No. Uh, I'm, I do asked you, that out of genuine curiosity. I was hoping <laughs> you guys like, knew about shorthand. Do you, have Let me you tell ever you seen anybody do shorthand or ever learned it yourself? I've not learned it. I've, yeah. I've seen it. but yeah, My grandma did it yeah. when, during sermons, mm-hmm. and I had no idea. What, I was like, it's this she's cool not writing circly, anything. It's this yeah. circly, loopy thing. It's yeah, kind of yeah. neat. I think now that we have computers, people can just type so fast yeah. that... Probably don't need it anymore. Yeah. Okay. So... The the discourses of Epictetus, you can read those too. Those are also published, but they are more, again, about the dynamic teaching style of Epictetus than anything else. And they are, you know, having to do with the concerns of his students and all of his like conversations with those kids. And that's not what we're focused on today. The Enchiridion is like a Stoic manual. This is how to live as a Stoic. And it's kind of aimed at the already fairly initiated that wanted to go deeper into philosophy. It is short. It's only... So it's like a how-to? Yeah, kind of. Yeah. It's just like, here's some basic precepts of of Stoicism, and they're very simple. And he didn't... One of the criticism, criticisms I think that's leveled at Epictetus is that he just wasn't that concerned with like the physical world. He didn't talk a lot about the cosmos or cosmology, and he wasn't mm. talking a lot about you know like our physical makeup and the natural world. It's so just he, it's metaphysics like, wasn't his jam. It's just moral philosophy. Yeah, like here's how here is how to live, and in that way, it seems it seems almost kind of moralizing. But it's I, really I've short. always sort of heard it presented almost like wisdom literature as mm. opposed to philosophy. Yeah, uh, I can see that. It's kind of close mm-hmm. to maybe wisdom literature because it's a lot of. Um, like little aphorisms, but it's more specific than that, isn't it? I think when wisdom, when I think wisdom literature, I think of kind of the vague. It's meant for yeah, really yeah. thinking about. And this isn't this more of a do this, do this. Do yeah, this. it's kind of a do this, do this, do this. And apparently, he's one of the only three real surviving Stoic literature originals that we have. Cool. Apparently, the most respected Stoic, his big manual, kind of the standard that everybody went by back then, is gone. It's lost the time. But uh-huh. we have three people, apparently, I, I forget the third, but Marcus Aurelius mm-hmm. is the, one of them. The emperor. The emperor. And Epictetus is another one. And then there's a third guy. I forget his name. But so I'm, I'm bringing you this guy today and I will hopefully continue on. All of this is stemming from a book I have called The Lives and Opinions of Eminent Philosophers or something like that. It's one of, it is our primary source for many of the philosophers that lived back then. It's a biography. So for example, Diogenes, we don't actually have any of Diogenes' teaching. The, I think the only source we have for him really is this, the lives and opinions of eminent philosophers. So I couldn't quite get an episode on Diogenes together for today, but you know, look forward to that in the future because I'll be referencing a lot. Yeah, from all we have of Diogenes is, is like his Twitter feuds. Yeah, yeah. and I want to do Epicurean as well. Uh, because the, the entire tenth book of the lives and opinions is dedicated to Epicurus. Speaking of those those cookies you have, are tasty. They're really good, right? <laughs> good. Yeah. Uh, shout out to H E B Mochaccino mm. Oreos. Keep yeah. doing your stinging, thing, H E B. Stinging tasty. Okay. Uh, I think Seneca is the third. Seneca. So, yeah, that sounds right. Seneca. All right. So today we're just going to go through this through a few things in this short volume. There are 51 small divisions. They're kind of like moral precepts that you go with. So I've taken a selection of these and I can read them and you can tell me what you think. In my reading, I have come to realize that I am a stoic. I think I adhere to many of these precepts, but I think there are some problems and some downfalls. And maybe you guys can point them out as we go. Hopefully you won't get bored. But if you (laughs) listener really want to go about reading this, it's only going to take you what. 45 minutes, yeah. maybe something like that. After you, last time you did the communist manifesto and this time you're doing the Enchiridion, which is also very short. I think you're doing this podcast thing, right? I need to pick shorter books is what I'm learning right now. I'm busy. I'm busy guy. You're a busy guy. You got a yeah. lot going on. Smart guy. Uh, yep. Yeah. Th- thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So the first, the first couple precepts, I feel like kind of set the stage for all the others. So these ones are a little bit longer especially this first one. I feel like all the other precepts kind of build on this one single idea. So precept number one, and you guys can give me your opinions. There are things which are within our power and there are things which are beyond our power. 
within our power, our opinion, aim, desire, aversion, and in one word, whatever affairs are our own. Beyond our power are body, property, reputation, office, and in one word, whatever are not properly our own affairs. Now, the things within our power are by nature free, unrestricted, unhindered. But those beyond our power are weak, dependent, restricted, and alien. Any thoughts so far? You're saying I have a weak body? Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's restricted and it's alien to you. The body is included in the... So is it, in well, the things not in your power. So the things that are in my power are what I think and how I feel. Mm-hmm. What's not in my power is literally everything else. Wait, how you feel is in your power? Wasn't it your aims? Desire, yeah. aversion. So if you like stuff and hate stuff. That's your, in your power? Your aims yes. and in huh. one word, whatever your... Yeah, opinion, aim, desire, and aversion. It's what he says. You can disagree with Yeah, that. I just think like your initial desire and maybe your initial aversion aren't in your power. Maybe but, impulse but are not, you're, but yeah, continued but then, desire Exactly, is. but then you get to choose sort of what you do with that impulse and desire. Um, for example, I, I didn't used to like coffee or I also didn't used to like whiskey, but I had the, I wanted to be, <laughs> but now you're like both at the same <laughs> I like both time together. <laughs> Every morning, um, yeah. no, but then, it, but I liked the idea of coffee and the idea of whiskey and yes. then I eventually developed a taste for it. So I was initially, uh, I don't know. So you're also very stoic is what you're saying. No, no, I'm just, I'm just saying that I think like emotions or how you feel often are beyond your control like on the outset, but how you, but you can master them and you can control them so that that's within your power, but you don't control that. Like if you saw a pathetic thing, like if I saw a little cute kid at our school, a little like in their little kindergarten uniform, look at an ice cream cone and then they lick it too hard and it plops on the ground. They start to cry. It's beyond my control that I'm going to feel bad. I will admit, I will feel bad because it is a bad thing to f- that has happened. But what I do about it is in my control, right? Does that make yes, sense? Yes. So then, how do you account for? Bless you. <laughs> there are differences Ooh, sorry, in guys. responses. So you feel pity for this yeah. kindergartner, yeah. and you know some mean student might laugh at that. Exactly. You know what I mean? So there is something in there where there's a difference. That difference comes from somewhere. I think. A stoic would say it's from the cultivation of certain attitudes toward others. Okay, we're not even close to finish with number one. Let's talk about this for the next 45 minutes. (laughs) Let me me finish number one, then we can talk about it for a minute. Let's talk about penguins. Then we can watch (laughs) it. (laughs) But do penguins get married? What is the motivation of penguins? They were made for life. Okay. (laughs) Now, the things within our power are by nature free, blah, blah, blah. Remember then that it. Uh, about did, that I, did I nail it? Yeah, so good. Yeah. So good. I can't. I can't do an impression of his voice. Of Werner Herzog? No, not Werner. Of what's his name? The guy that was in Shawshank Redemption. Oh, I don't know about that. I never watched that movie. What? How have you never watched that? Movie? How have you not, really? You would love that movie. Just, okay. <laughs> good talk. Okay, we'll have to take it. Werner Herzog and the penguin goes off towards the mountains. <laughs> Why? Very good. Why would he do such a thing? Werner Herzog doing March of the Penguins. By all, what's happening? Yeah. You've By never all seen accounts, this? he is crazy. Google Werner Herzog penguins at some point. He done a docu- oh, he's done a documentary <laughs> asking the question, do penguins feel nihilism? And his conclusion no, is didn't. yes. Is that true? I'm, oh, it so is it's not, awesome. It and is the, not a lie. My favorite part is when he's interviewing the guy who actually hangs out with the penguins. like, do penguins ever feel despair Does, and like want to leave the community because of some deep emotional angst? He's like... I mean, they wander off sometimes. I've never seen a, <laughs> never seen a ping and go, you know, do that. <laughs> He's just clearly like, ah, uh, no. <laughs> Sorry, Epictetus <laughs> has something to say to this. No, penguin. you should really go watch this stuff. It's, it's really funny. awesome, and yeah. I want Werner Herzog to just narrate my life. Do he you? gets in his car, feeling distraught about the morning yeah, commute. Th- that's why you don't want him to dark soul. To, yeah, to, yeah. AJ has the darkest soul. Not a chance. <laughs> Sorry, He has licked the ice cream too hard. <laughs> has fallen from his cone. What will he do now? Okay, so remember then that if you attribute freedom to things by nature dependent and take what belongs to others for your own, you will be hindered. You will lament. You will be disturbed. You will find fault with both gods and men. Basically, if you let those things that aren't under your control, if you are under the impression that they are. But if you take for your own only that which is your own and view what belongs to others just as it really is, then no one will ever compel you. No one will ever restrict you. You will find fault with no one. You will accuse no one. You will do nothing against your will. No one will hurt you. You will not have an enemy, nor will you suffer any harm. 
Aiming, therefore, at such great things, remember that you must not allow yourself any inclination, however slight, toward the attainment of the others, but that you must entirely quit some of them and for the present postpone the rest. That sentence is kind of vague, and mm-hmm. I, I, I've been trying to tangle with it, and I don't really understand what he's aiming at. There, those, uh, the references there are kind of detached. I don't know what it references. But if you would have these and possess power and wealth likewise, you may miss the latter in seeking the former, and you will certainly fail of that by which alone happiness and freedom are procured. Seek at once, therefore, to be able to say to every unpleasing semblance, you are but a semblance, and by no means the real thing. And then examine it by those rules which you have, and first and chiefly by this, whether it concerns the things which are within our own power or things which are not, and if it concerns anything beyond our power, be prepared to say that it is nothing to you. All right, that is the end of one. Are you taking notes? I, I am. Um, okay. Yeah. So that's the end of one. That is the big precept, right? There are things in your control, and these include your opinions, your desires, what you hate, what you like. And there are things that are not in your control, which pretty much includes everything else, everything outside your own brain. And so things inside, free, things outside, alien, restricting, slave, right? I I can't control whether or not I break my foot. Mm -hmm. Like I can maybe take some measures, but it might might get broken, Mm -hmm. right? So if I uh, attach my happiness to those things that are external, I will always be compelled, offended, disappointed, and frustrated, right? Whereas if I restrict my happiness only to the things inside, I can remain happy. No one will ever compel me to do anything. Or that no matter, so let's say you break your foot, you still control your internal reaction to the breaking of the foot. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just a, I detach myself and I don't do anything. It's I am resilient in the face of whatever happens to me. Yeah, the vicissitudes of fortune have no effect on you. Yeah, sure. But what, like, would you call Epictetus to help you move your couch? Like, is he a good friend? Does this, does this kind of philosophy lend itself to being a good companion, friend, husband? It seems like if he's like, I'm sorry, I can't control you, Thomas. Therefore, I'm not going to like worry about you. Sure. Or, you know, marriage to Epictetus where it's yeah. like, you know, your problems are your problems yeah. and I only control my <laughs> internal responses. Oh, man. So, yeah. Okay. So let's, uh, let's jump to another section. No, no, no. We will. Here we go. 16. This okay. has to do with exactly what you're asking. Okay. When you see anyone weeping for grief, either that his son has gone abroad or that he has suffered in his affairs, take care not to be overcome by the apparent evil, but discriminate and be ready to say, what hurts this man is not this occurrence itself, for another man might not be hurt by it, but the view he chooses to take of it. As, well, seriously. I know, but is that what you say to him? No, so he says, as far as conversation goes, however, Mm -hmm. do not disdain to accommodate yourself to him and if need be, to groan with him. Take heed, however, not to groan inwardly too. Like, look, your friend is in a place and whether or not he should have that opinion of that place is like, that is his affair, right? Yeah, maybe something bad happens in his life. He can, he is disappointed. He can choose to be disappointed. He can choose not to be. You can't let it affect you, but he's your friend. You should, you should groan with him, right? You should fake it. Don't feel it yourself. Yeah, well, I mean, like, do you feel to the fullest extreme every misfortune of your neighbor? No, I don't. Nor could you. I guess the question is, should you? Mm -hmm. Is that what you're trying to get at? No, it's, um, um, it just sort of seems like it's giving you license to not really be bonded emotionally to your friend. Sure. You keep you your real opinions are kept separate from how you act yes. with that person so they don't yeah. really know you so in some sense like if it like if if, if you, Epictetus writes this book everybody reads it and they're like ah this is your moral philosophy and then your child dies and Epictetus comes to comfort you you know he's just like saying well humans like it when we comfort them so Epictetus robot will you know run that program <laughs> I think that's the cynical way of looking at it because you could just as well say Epictetus is focused on what does that other person need and Mm -hmm. I'm going to act that way. Would you act, would you say that the person who just responds in the moment is better to that person? Like they're doing what they want to do as opposed to what AJ just read of this person's in grief. I don't feel that same grief, but I'm going to act comfortingly toward them because that's what the situation requires. And even if they adopt my grief, is that, like, better? is that, is that better? Is that even their right? Yeah, like, no, you're probably right. Do they get to have my grief just yeah. because they're nearby? Mm-hmm. I guess it's, um, 
maybe I'm making a jump that Epictetus isn't making, which is he has disdain for the person who's letting their feelings oh. swamp their behavior. Right, because they're, uh, they're inferior. Because they're right. inferior. Yeah. And maybe he's not making that jump. He has to make a statement about people who aren't this oh, way. Oh, he does. I have to look it up. Hold yeah, on. Let's call him out. Sorry. I got to find it. That, and that's my concern, sure. is that he's like... Look at all the, like these, look at the sheeple. Yeah, with all, all their emotions. <laughs> with yeah. their emotions. Yeah, exactly. Oh, man, hold on. I got to find it. It's got to be in there, and I'm sure. It is. I just, I don't think I, I took a note of it. Mm. So uh, as I, as I yeah, look we'll, for we'll this quote it. in my Kindle app, uh, you guys can discuss, I guess my point was going to be, Graham, I can love you as a friend. Do I have to do that with desire that may be frustrated if you act in a way that does not adhere to my desires? Like, can I love you? Mm-hmm without having to be affected by if you are feeling messed up or if you're angry at me or whatever. Can I love without any any desire for a certain outcome? Does that make sense? No. Uh, what do you mean can desire I, for Can I give sense? without expecting, right? I can love you even if you're angry at me. Even if you are having a bad day, you're having a horrible time, I can still love you yes. without any change to the steadiness of my, my own ship doesn't have to be rocked because yours is in a storm. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm saying is like, I can help you from my ship and, and give you aid without bringing my ship into the storm itself. That's fine. But do you, but do you act in such a way that you think I'm lame for piloting a ship through a storm? We might have to have a conversation about it later. So you think that I think we're in the middle of the storm. I can't shout at you and say like, do better. It's stupid to be in a storm. Suck it up. <laughs> yeah, but maybe maybe a conversation later about like, hey man, one of the reasons you're affected is your own choice. Yeah, I mean, this was what I was writing down. This was the question that I wanted to have in the after show is, um, is can you, like, how do you talk to people who are, um, I was thinking mainly students. Like, if you have students that are getting upset over things that they shouldn't get upset about because they're immature, um, what is that sort of proper response Epictetus would say they need to master Control. their emotions. Yeah. And I think that there's a lot of that that is true. Mm-hmm. But the but then how yes, but then for the person who has not mastered their emotions and is going through difficulty, um, I always feel like Epictetus or the Stoics are gonna be kind of like punks. Be like, look at the weak. Is that what no, he says? I mean it, he says to like if your brother's groaning, groan with him. You don't have to let it affect you. And then he, I don't think he ever talks about disdaining others. It is mm-hmm. very much a self-rule thing. Yeah. Right. And he doesn't, he, he even says like, look, let your, let the way that you talk in public. And this is, uh, this was stuff I wasn't intending to read, but mm-hmm. let the way that you talk in public, not be number one about your own accomplishments. Number two about your philosophy, because maybe they're not ready for it. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, if they ask you, you can tell them, but it's not, it's not, it ain't about you, mm-hmm. right? And let, so he even says, like, you take in grass, the grass of philosophy, but you don't walk up to another sheep and go, blah, and show them all your grass. <laughs> mm-hmm. sure. You you let the evidence be in your, like, shiny, your nice wool, wool and, and your, your wool coat, and milk. Yeah. Right? I love that quote. Oh, you know that. That's from. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, no student, uh, uh, the, the sheep does not show that he's basically saying, that, yeah, I can't remember the way that he I can, phrases it. I can it. search it up. Uh, I have it in my commonplace book, but. Um, What's it about? The, sh- the sheep does not show that he has eaten grass by by throwing oh. it up in front of you, but by having wool and milk. And the student, and so the idea being that the student or the or the learner doesn't show that he has learned something by barfing it on a page, right. but by the virtue and by the the, the person that he becomes. Okay. So right here. So if there ever should be among the ignorant any discussion of principles, for, be for the most part silent. So if they're talking about moral philosophy, mm-hmm. you can just shut your mouth. Right. Uh, for there is great danger in hastily throwing out what is undigested. And if anyone tells you that you know nothing and you are, and you are not nettled at it, right? Cause we've already, we are a ways in here. This is precept 46. You know, you shouldn't be, if somebody's insulting you, you shouldn't be bothered by it. Then you may be sure that you have really entered on your work for sheep. Do not hastily sh- throw up the grass to show the shepherds how much they've eaten, but inwardly digesting their food. They produce it outwardly in wool and milk. Thus, therefore, do not make an exhibition before the ignorant of your principles, but of the actions to which their digestion gives rise. Mm -hmm. So I I don't have to disdain people just because they're chatting. I can, you know, just do my do my work at home. Yes. Is he the guy that says, um, don't argue about what it means to be a good man? Be one. Is that Epictetus? Yeah. The last section is talking about, Okay, we talk about whether it is good to lie. And then we talk about, Okay. 
what is lying? And then we talk about where does this precept arise that we question about lying? It's like philosophy is all about number three when we should really be concerned about number one. Mm -hmm. Should we lie? Yeah. Right. He's very, he's very much like boots hit the road kind of moral philosophy. Yeah, 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 yeah. So here's the section about looking down on others. Okay. The condition and characteristic of a vulgar person is that he never looks for either help or harm from himself, but only externals. Right? So if he's having a problem, he's going to go somewhere else for him. If he's, yeah. The con- condition and characteristic of a philosopher is that he looks to himself for all help or harm. The marks of a proficient are that he censures no one, praises no one, blames no one, accuses no one, says nothing concerning himself as being anybody or knowing anything. So yeah, there is the vulgar, there is the philosopher, but someone who is a de- someone who's moved along, he's not going to go around, you know, dunking on people just because he's a philosopher. That seems but great. he also doesn't, won't praise anybody. Yeah. So he's not going to give you a very good best man speech. If you're not worthy of it. I mean, the other side, in theory, he could be giving a best man speech to a great Stoic as well, right? He could be speaking at Seneca's wedding or something like that. And would he praise Seneca at that point? Mm, uh, he would praise his internal characteristics, yeah. right? It, it's, saying it that way doesn't make it seem like a bad thing. Yeah, I guess right? so. You're, you're locating the praise in a place where it's something they've actually controlled as opposed to praising someone because they're lucky that they got rich. Yeah. Right. That would be the stoic. Mm-hmm. And part of, part of the Enchiridion also talks about, Hey, you don't know what's going on in a guy's life. Right. Like mm-hmm. maybe he drinks a little too much, but you don't know how his day was. So you can blame him for drinking too much, but you don't know you don't have any idea what's going on in that guy's life. So, mm-hmm. so can it, right? Maybe a guy bathes hastily, but you don't, you don't know what's, what's going on, what he's got to deal with or what is happening in his day. So that's where part of the don't praise or blame comes from. It's don't, you know, don't spout off about stuff you know nothing about. Mm-hmm. It's kind of a, you need to walk a mile in his shoes before you talk about his life. But can you, but that's the question. Once he's walked a mile in his shoes, will he then talk about his life? Or is he saying you never can? I don't know. Let me, let me look up that section. You guys are running me all over. I just want to know if you can judge people or not. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You want to judge people? You can do that all you want. Too. There you go. Okay. Hold on. Hold on. This, so this is precept number 45. Sorry. Does anyone bathe hastily? Do not say that he does it ill, but hastily. Mm. Does anyone drink much wine? Do not say that he does ill, but that he drinks a great deal. <laughs> For unless you perfectly understand his motives, how should you know if he acts ill? Thus, you will not risk yielding to any appearances, but such as you fully comprehend. Like, if you don't know what he's, why he's doing it, you can't make any claim about it. Um, there's another, there's another one that talks about like, yeah, you might be more eloquent than this other guy. You might be faster than this other guy, but all you can say is that you're faster than him. You can't say that you are better yeah. at all. And so he even talks about that. Like, yeah, maybe you're eloquent, maybe you're quick, but you does not consist in quickness or in eloquence. Mm-hmm. So, but does you, you can't cons- say that you're better. Does you consist in uh, emotional control? Like, the things that you can control is it, then do you make the value judgment that the stoic who, when his son dies, shed, you know, is like, this doesn't affect me uh, versus the man who is weeping. Are you, are you trying to ask whether or not he would say it is better to have emotional control? Because yeah. clearly, yes, yeah. like yes. that's the whole point. And that's the point of like, we just talked about this in the AMA of all education. You have to make some value judgment at some point. Mm-hmm. And so the value judgment here is yes, it is better to control your emotions. In every case, there's no there's there's no health in having an emotion expressed. Is there a healthy expression of emotion? It is. It is supposed to be in accordance with nature. And he's like, okay, much of what you are expressing are emotions that don't really need to happen. Okay. Like, and he, he talks that. about, okay, look, say the neighbor kid breaks a cup, mm-hmm. you're not going to be real tore up about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What if you break a cup? What's different? Yeah. Like you should have as much like you should have as much emotional attachment to his cup as to your cup. It's just a cup. It's not you. It's outside of you. Right. So you should be just as torn up about a lost cup. But what, if it, says, what if it resulted because uh, of care of your own personal carelessness and in that broken cup, you realize that you're a pretty careless person that would, that would should tear you up more than realizing that like your yeah, neighbor exactly. is a careless person. But I think, I think that would be, but in that case, you are not torn up about the cup. You are torn up about your own carelessness, which is a thing that you can control. And can you, should you not be torn up about the carelessness of someone else? 
Not necessarily. Okay. You can't control it. They can, though. Because yeah. should Thomas be concerned about Asher's inability to carry things? Were we a little, a little child? Like, yeah. you, you know what I mean? Like, from the quote um, before, it was you wouldn't comment on he did ill. It's just you would say he broke a cup. Oh, gotcha. So it lacks. It sounds like it lacks that emotional aspect to it, or it lacks a judgment. It's trying to be objective in the description of this is what happened, not why it happened. Yeah, or even that it was terribly negative. There's one part where he talks about, so you lose something. You lose a cup. Mm -hmm. You lose your wife. You lose your kid. If you simply say, like, these things were given to me, and they have been restored to their original owner, that is a way different perspective. They weren't yours. They were outside of you. And they were just taken back. And weirdly enough, he does comment upon faith. He's like, they have... The gods have ordered the universe. They have set everything in motion. They are perfectly wise. They know everything. And if you submit to them, instead of being given up to the, you know, the like up and down of life, if you just say, hey, they've perfectly ordered the universe, you can do your faith simply and easily without having to worry about much at all. There is a thing that I think will make you grumpy. And we are, we are way Me? off the rails here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're, we are way off the rails as far as what Sorry. I had planned for this episode, which was to kind of go beginning to end. So audience, again, you are not getting the flow of yeah, this I book. Apologize. Oh no, I think it's fine because each one of these is kind of disjointed. Like there is yeah. a flow, but after precept one and two, it's all just kind of variations on the same theme. Okay. Um, okay. So do you want to jump back to the order that you had before? Slate. We will in a second. Okay. Hold on. What is it? Um, unhappy. I'm trying to figure out the search word to find this. Okay, here we go. If you would improve, lay aside such reasonings as these. And I think this is where you were, Graham. So he's telling you to lay these aside, buddy. You got to mm -hmm. get over it. If I neglect my affairs, I shall not have a maintenance. If I do not punish my servant, he will be good for nothing. Basically, if I don't do anything, things are, things are going to go screwy, right? If I don't take control of my world, my world is going to go upside down. He says, for it were better to die of hunger, exempt from grief and fear, than to live in affluence with perturbation, right? So I would much rather be free and living under a bridge than be worried about my wealth all the time and like running my house. Uh, and it is better that your servants should be bad than you unhappy. So yeah, if you don't get all up in your servant's business, he's probably going to turn out to be good for nothing, but man, you're going to run yourself ragged doing it. So it's better to just have kind of a bad servant and be totally, you know, happy yourself than run yourself ragged trying to correct him all the time. Yeah, again, I the, the point that Graham was raising before of essentially everything that's outside of yourself kind of gets lumped into this one category of they take care of themselves, I take care of myself, and I'm only concerned with the taking care of not even my body because body counts as external correct mm -hmm. he does say that you should you know do what's necessary for maintaining your body like sure. you know give it the exercise it needs and sure. give it the food and drink it needs and treat it nice yeah but all it it, it stoicism is kind of ironing out th there being any social relationships so that you know in our you know we've conflated at this point the cup versus my servant's behavior versus the death of my son like they all kind of become something external to myself that should be viewed Similarly, right? Because they're out of my control, I shouldn't get too worked up about them because I couldn't have prevented it anyway if it was truly beyond my power. Yeah. To quote, is a little oil spilled or a little wine stolen? Say to yourself, this is the price paid for peace and tranquility and nothing is to be had for nothing. Like, yeah, let's spill a little wine, but that's the price of being peaceful. And when you call your servant, consider that it is possible he may not come at your call, or if he does, that he may not do what you wish. But it is not at all desirable for him and very undesirable for you that it should be in his power to cause you any disturbance. Right. Right. If he knows ah, I'm not going to come and really stick it to my master. If you're like, I don't give two flips. Right. Then it's, it's better for both of you. And a lot, so much of this is, I think, not necessarily about just making sure you don't have personal relationships, but that you take appropriate perspective. So there's one part where it says if you are if you are insulted. Right. You can either take offense mm. or you can say, whew, if he had known all my other faults, he wouldn't have stopped there. Mm. Right. Like be aware of your faults. And yeah, he probably meant to hurt you, but you don't have to be hurt. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so it's much more saying like, yeah, these things and he even says evil doesn't exist. It's a really short passage. It's one thing. He says, okay. you don't set up a target for the purpose of missing with the arrow. Mm. Therefore, the nature of evil does not exist. And I'm like, whoa, I feel like that's a leap. But 
you know, Augustine was in the same place. And so it is, it is so much more about controlling your own attitudes about things that have gone wrong. Like if I didn't desire it to go perfectly my way in the first place, I can't be totally hacked if it didn't turn out. And for this reason, he says, you should keep the matter of death constantly before your mind, right? You're going to die one day. Yep. If, on the web. Oh, did you? Oh, Siri's <laughs> been listening to our entire conversation and they just searched for your entire last paragraph. That's hilarious. Anyway. Right? You're going to die one day and he's like, we, we fear death not because we know it is bad because nobody knows it's bad, yep. right? We fear death because of an attitude we have about it. If we can change our attitude about it, we shouldn't fear it. Take, for example, Socrates. Didn't fear death. Had an appropriate ad- attitude about it. Sure. Right? Again, same thing of... That Socrates himself had this view toward his death, I, which is different from the view toward the death of my wife, the death of my child. And that's where I mean that, um, you know, we should continue on and like actually hear the argument that um, Epictetus is making. But Stoicism tends to be something that I think is right for like 80 percent, 90 percent of situations. And like, yeah, you shouldn't get worked up about the kid across the street breaking a cup. Your example from before. I do think there's you c- contrast that with. Aristotle's view toward friendship, where the friendship of excellence is one where you match the feelings of those. Your happiness comes from the happiness of others. So there is an emotional aspect to it, but it's not just the I maximize my own happiness. It's, or, or rather, I maximize my happiness by maximizing that of the people I care most about. That's all. Again, I, that maybe it's an in between conversation. Maybe it's toward the end of the episode. No, no, no. I think this is a this is a fair thing. I mean, you guys kind of have the gist of the book. We might. Yeah. I mean, clearly we've been jumping around and yeah. hitting hitting multiple things, sure. and I'm about to hit another one. But the if your happiness is dependent upon the happiness of your friends, I think that's where Epictetus would get cranky. Sure. But if he says it is well within your power to give as much happiness as you can to your friends and to remind them that you know their happiness also does not depend on externals, then do that. Right. Like yep. you can give happiness to your friends without being absolutely tied to it yourselves. I can every day bring Graham cookies. And mm-hmm. if he says you're a worm and I hate you, I can be like, whew, lucky you don't know the rest of my faults. Sure. See you no, tomorrow, no, you, buddy. I'll no, bring no, you cookies. You bring, me, you bring me cookies every day. And I say you bringing me cookies is outside my control. Therefore, mm-hmm. I am me. not I'm going to be impacted by these cookies. OK, man, you guys are just leading right into everything I want to read. I love it. This We're is perfect. You up for all this. Yeah, Good. seriously. It's like you're just setting me up for every single thing I wanted to read. This and is you're perfect. like, Graham, you're my best friend. And I'm like, I can't control that. I will not react to it. That, that, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. I see okay. what you're saying. And, and this is one of the biggest questions I have at the end. I don't want to get to yet, but mm-hmm. all of this is kind of leading towards, okay, mm-hmm. if I'm supposed to deny my passions, what are they for? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the first place. Okay. Great question. Yeah. Okay, so we are, we're going to get there, but here's a little bit about... Uh, I, I actually put at the end of this note, whew, party pooper, because man, it sure seems like you are just going to be a bummer at parties. So mm-hmm. if you are dazzled by the semblance of any promised pleasure, so pleasure's coming, we're going to have a party, you guys, Woo. guard yourself against being bewildered by it, but let the affair wait your leisure and procure for yourself some delay. So you're like, the party's coming. Whew, I'm gonna have to take some time by myself. Right. Then bring to your, I'm serious, right? Get some delay before yeah. you jump into the pleasure. Then bring to your mind both points of time, that in which you shall enjoy the pleasure and that in which you will repent and reproach yourself after you have enjoyed it. What? And set before you in opposition to these, how you will rejoice and applaud yourself if you abstain. So as I'm thinking about the party, I have to keep in mind when I am doing it, Right when I enjoy the pleasure, and when later I'm going to reproach myself for having enjoyed the party, and then how much I will congratulate myself if I have refrained from enjoying the party. So that's silly, right? So and even though it should appear to you as a seasonable gratification, take heed that its enti- enticements and allurements and seductions may not subdue you, but set in opposition to this how much better it is to be conscious of having g- gained so great a victory. So you stay away from the party and we're like, Hey man, what's the deal? And you're like, I have gained a great victory over myself today and that I was not overcome by the pleasures of a party. This reminds me of Mary at the ball in Pride and Prejudice. (laughs) It really does (laughs) where she's just kind of dunking on everybody. So this is where I think it might break down a little bit. Mm -hmm, Right. And I, and you guys have mentioned a couple spots where it also seems to break down. What if I have a son? Don't I want him to grow? Mm -hmm. Like, isn't there some sort of filial responsibility there paternal paternal Mm -hmm. filial son right yeah yeah, paternal responsibility yeah paternal responsibility there that that i have towards 
my kid. It's it seems a sketchy thing to me to just go. Burp, there's a kid, and now he's outside of my control, and what happens to him is completely disconnected from my feelings. Yeah, this was the question I wrote: is what what is his view on like duty and responsibility? Because you were saying like, oh, I it was real. I can't keep my fortune from dwindling, so our, my fortune is up to fate. Well, you can be a good steward of your finances, and yes, you could. there may be something that completely wipes you out, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't have any sort of responsibility to keeping... Make you, an effort. Yeah, make an, sure. making an effort. He also talks about, you know, becoming a member of the state, and he's like, you can only do it so much as you can control and do it safely and without, you know, giving into externals and without, you know, giving away too much of your self-control so you know only go in so far as much as you are willing right which i think is probably good advice right there there's some boundaries you can Mm -hmm. overstep and there's a really good section at the end where he's basically like you know what you should do stop procrastinating and do it Mm -hmm. which it's good advice it's it's great advice advice. but but this does lead to the okay granted if i am too attached to external things it can be a problem right and we've we've seen this with students we've seen students that are over affected by things that are happening in their lives and they are not taking a healthy perspective of things. And there is a point at which someone and I, said something mean. Yeah. Right. And then there's right. a point at which I certainly do this. Like you wreck your car. Well, you get torn up about it or think, Hey, I was lucky to have a car in the first place. There really is a point at which perspective matters. Sure. Right. And can totally control your reaction to a situation. Sure. Yes. Um, then what is the correct place for passions mm-hmm. and especially responsibilities? Yeah, what right. are passions for is a great question for a Stoic. Did you say he has an answer to that question? He doesn't. Oh, oh, oh. He doesn't seem to. Uh, he, he wants to act in accordance with nature. But even there, there seems to be a breakdown because by nature, humans are pretty passionate creatures. Sure. Well, that may be the answer that, that, that there, is, there are natural passions that should be played through naturally. Uh, maybe he doesn't go there, but that's always been my my thought that has to be the stoic answer is that there is an, that there are appropriate emotions to feel at appropriate occasions that need to sort of work themselves through. And then at the end of it, you kind of feel embarrassed about the fact that you let those emotions happen, but you should do it. You should do that anyway. That was I think you'd only be embarrassed if you let them happen in excess. Yeah. But there, but I certainly agree with, look, you don't have to be offended, mm-hmm. right? There, there, that is a choice. You don't have to be disappointed when something material of yours is lost, right? You were lucky to have it in the first place. If it was a gift, the gift can be taken back. There is a way to go through life with just not being affected by those things. Yeah, the, 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 the offended man chooses to be offended is a helpful heuristic. And I think I agree with you, Maggie, like 80, 90% of the time. But then there are, then there's like... Um, when the sacred is desecrated. Yes. Or, and... And the, either the sanctity of a uh, relationship with your wife, um, uh, if if you're at a party, if you're at a dinner party and a member of the dinner party is just like making really inappropriate comments about your spouse, and you're like, I gained a great victory by not having these offend me. Right. It's like, mm, no, you're also you know, at some point you're now like uh, complicit. Not, you're complicit or not doing your your duty and responsibility as a husband. Yeah, I have I have had to walk away from conversations like that. Yeah, where you know someone was getting a dress down and I just ha- couldn't be a part of it anymore. So, I, yeah, I think there is a point at which this breaks down. It's so like yeah, a ninety percent of situations, it's this great. Is exactly right. Yeah. You can you can be separate from the whims of fortune and being totally under the control of things that you cannot control. Right. Right. If I've given away my self control to things that no one can control. Yeah. But. But there is a time and there's a place for emotions. Like yes. on my wedding day, I should feel happy that something external is yeah. happening. Yes. You would not win a great victory for yourself mm-hmm. by not having By keeping in mind the exactly. time that I will reproach myself yes. for having enjoyed my wedding day. Yeah. Or if God did the same thing with his children. If God was like, well, they're on their own mm-hmm. and I've gained a great victory by not caring what happens to them. Right? No, but he condescends and becomes human. Right. And so there's something, you know, it's a good thing God wasn't stoic. <laughs> <laughs> but... AJ, you started this by saying that reading this has shown to you that you are a Stoic. Do you want to say more about what you mean by that? In in many ways, I am. And this is and what that I'm, may be the key, right? In many ways, the 80%, the 90%. Oh, sorry. No, no, you're right. I, I, I do think in most, 
in most situations, I try to take perspective where things just don't affect me. And I, I honestly think this came from being picked on pretty heavily as a kid. You had to learn it or you'd go crazy, right? If, if what you, and this is what I felt every day at school was betrayal. Kids would hang out with me after school. We'd be friends. The next day they would betray me in front of their friends mm-hmm. to seem cool. Right. right? So after so many betrayals and being physically messed up, I'm not, I'm not, I swear I'm not doing this for pity. It's, it turned out to be one of the greatest things for me because I had to learn how to be okay with external things, just not going my way right. and trying to learn a different perspective on it, which is like, these kids are not that mature, right? They want to look good in front of their friends and they don't know how to navigate that very well. And I get it. I'm also pretty nerdy. If they knew the extent to which I was nerdy, they'd probably be even harder on me. And there are, there are ways to navigate that with just with not getting offended and being okay with it. Were they doing wrong? Probably, but I can't stop them. But I can certainly, but with the whole, you know, turn the other cheek and submit to others. And if someone takes your cloak, give them your shirt. Mm -hmm. Like there, there is a way to go about being abused or, you know, I'm I'm trying to be careful. Not I understand. Yes. Yeah. So, but but again, that's even you putting that caveat in there, like, and this goes back to the conversation that the three of us have had a thousand times already, but like I hear that. (laughs) That's the point of the podcast. That's the whole point of the podcast. We only talk about like three things uh, is (laughs) that, well then why not also improve your situation? I, I understand that there's a virtue to being able to be resilient in any given situation. I'm not speaking AJ to your specific. Oh, go story. ahead though. You no, can. no, I'm not though. I'm just saying that like if someone came to you and they're like, uh, yeah, get good AJ. <laughs> well, that's the thing is Stop I did things. in fifth grade. I, I got tired of it and I left. Like I walked out of I mean. school in the middle of the day and walked home just but, middle class, but mm. that's not stoicism. That's you required an external thing, moving yourself to be better Right. You know what I mean? And, yep. But you did the right thing. Everyone should skip school. That's, that's what I'm saying on a podcast. You did the right thing by doing something external as opposed to I'm going to, you know, get tough and not let this impact me. Does that make sense? That's the problem. And that's, and that's why I wanted to be careful how I talk about abuse because there's yes. a point at which you like got to get out of there. Yes. Exactly. You know? And the answer is not just get stronger and not impacted by things. Yeah, that, that's maybe this is a question we can say for the after episode is, is there a limit to the trauma that a person can feel, even just like on our neurobiological level where we can't think, maybe we can't sort of like perspective our way out of it? Um, can you say more? I'm just thinking like, is there, uh, is there uh, um, situations uh, or... or um, uh, external things affecting you either bodily or emotionally that are that are so extreme um, even to the point of like uh, you know affecting you cognitively affecting you uh, uh, emotionally uh, so much so that like the very physical makeup of your of your hormones and body get all out of whack that can't just be fixed by a perspective shift I think so yes yeah I, I think I've seen it yeah like my uh I think one of my nephews struggles with this. Yeah. Right? He was adopted, and I think some of that early trauma has has had a lingering effect, right? That he can't necessarily counteract, no matter how much he thinks about it. And I, I, I think I, I was, um, and maybe this is just. And then the other thing is, is okay. Then people who, like I lived a pretty, have lived a pretty charmed life, a wonderful childhood, family who loved me, uh, 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 had friends. Sure, I was picked on in school, but. Uh, I've never had when I was young growing up real difficult situations. And so then when I've been in a, in a difficult situation that I was outside of my control, I realized I actually don't have any kind of tools to deal with this. Um, and um, whereas other people who probably like that's old hat <laughs> would have been like, nah, this ain't so bad. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So I just wonder if, um, if yeah, can there be such such traumatic uh, ex- uh, things that a perspective that, 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 that stoicism can't fix us. Oh yeah. I think absolutely. Yeah, yeah, Repeated yeah. severe yeah, yeah. is like, I think it's, it is stoicism is hard pressed to survive that kind of trouble. Yeah. Right. Repeated severe difficulty. I think it's just might not go far enough. I think for your everyday bottom dollar offense. Yes. And, and for just like a little bit of hardship, like there is a certain extent to which you should be able to master those yes. things for and, the, and be prepared for more hardship. Normatively speaking, or if we wanted to talk about like average common life, yeah, then eight, yeah, then and so, so this then kind of, then th- this ability to be able to put things into proper perspective is 
And that's a good thing for a person to be able to cultivate. Yeah, yeah. I agree with that. But so to go back to my own experience, because I'm, I'm, well, I'm trying to just be sure. wary of everybody else's. There was a point at which it was too far. Like I had been punched in the face too many times. Yeah, yeah. I'd had rocks thrown at me too many times. This, but the particular day that I walked away from school, I had tried to join a kickball game, mm-hmm. and they threw the kickball at my head until I left. Mm-hmm. The whole team. Yeah. And I was like, you know what? I'm done. Yeah, I think I'm kind of, oh, like, I had been through all the emotional trouble of trying to be stoic and right. find a good attitude and get over it, and it was just, it was time to be done. But so then, I left. So is your takeaway from that, that that is a weakness of stoicism, or do you look back on that and think you should have stayed in that environment? I don't, I, my life was so much better after, after I left, yeah, sure. and I, like, I learned a lot of good lessons from that time, but... I think remaining in it would not have been good for me. Sure. And so is this a weakness of stoicism that it is unable to deal with everything, everything? Well, yeah, no. I, no, so. I don't think it's that's, weak. not, that's not a weakness. No, no. it's a tool. You, it's a, a thing can't be, can't, can't deal with everything except this is a, it's a, a philosophical for, worldview. And but it's, it's a playbook for 80% of the, of life. Like if, if you yeah. think of it that way, then, then, then that's helpful. Yeah. And even the, the bit about not getting overwhelmed by, a c- upcoming pleasure. I think it's a pretty good rule, right? D- don't don't give yourself up to it. And then feel awful when you've gone way too far. Mm-hmm. But you should also probably not do that when your friend's throwing a party, mm-hmm. or when sure. someone gives you a present, you or should. when Christmas is coming up. Yeah. Like, yeah, it, those it, are pleasures that you should indulge in. Yeah, imagining that someone you love give, gives you a present and your response is, "This has no impact on my life. This is outside of me, and I can choose yeah. to be excited or not excited about it." And I do think it's easy to. Um, make fun of it, uh, the message of you are in control of your response to these things, yes. I think is an important one. Very important that, one. That is a, I, you know, you said this book takes 45 minutes to read. It's probably worth everyone reading, right? Uh, yeah, it is, it is a great read. And a lot of these things are quick and obvious and easy to internalize and so important in and if one of Twitter them, cancer culture. That's what uh, I mean. If cancel, one, it, cancel and cancer culture. Yeah. Oh, that's horrible. But if one of them like sticks out to you and is like, wow, I, you know, I do th- take things too personally from people who don't matter to me or something like that. Yeah. That makes it worthwhile for the whatever 45 minutes it takes to read. Or getting super offended about one small thing when you're like, you know what? I have a lot more problems than they're even keying into. Yes. Right. Yeah. Do you think, are we making a caricature of stoicism? Do you think that like, would, would the big three disagree with how we're characterizing this kind of lack of emotion and important I think, situations? I think the Enchiridion is maybe a little too simple to fully encapsulate exactly what Stoicism is. I am sure that the Masters had had conversations about, okay, where, what role do the passions have in everyday life? And I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to read the dialogues of Epictetus to kind of find some of this nuance that I, that feels like is perhaps missing from the Enchiridion because it really just feels like a basic day-to-day manual. And I don't know. I, it feels unfair to characterize Stoicism based solely on this one document sure, and yes. then say there are problems and therefore... Right. Right? That's where I think we're all bringing in all the other stuff we've read about Stoicism, which I think it's fair to, to your point there of... Um, and also because Stoicism is having a moment these days. It is. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. But Epictetus is not writing like the full history and the full ideology of Stoicism. It's he's just, not giving cosmology and he's yeah. not giving, yeah, even metaphysics. He's just saying, don't get offended when people make fun of you. Which is great advice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think that's pretty good. Well, well that, that took a just a Weird way term. different path than I thought we were going to take. But it makes, it makes it more fun, though, right? You yeah, so much more fun. Yeah. Is offended? this what your episodes feel like them, every yeah. time? Every single time. This yeah. is what we do to you? This yeah, is, I'm, so, I'm so I'm sorry. Very, I'm very nervous about the next one. We'll see how this goes. <laughs> I just don't stop talking so that... <laughs> during my episodes? No, during mine. Oh, during yours. Okay. So that no one can get a word in edgewise. And if you do, that's why I give you that look. <laughs> I was kidding. <laughs> I feel like I'm usually there. I usually just hit... I just start with a book and I just keep going and you guys just go, mm-hmm, uh-huh. mm-hmm. 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 But today we got more conversation. That was good. That's very good. We got more. I, I, got, I mean, I, like, I, mean, I could go back and start reading back from the beginning, but I feel like we. <laughs> do you have any I mean, other? I've got questions for the after after show. For okay, sure. I yeah. think we we did a pretty good. Cool. Uh, like I said, that that first precept kind of sets out the whole overarching yeah. idea, and then it just sort of works itself out into everyday life in a few different areas. Uh, that second to last precept about if you know what you're supposed to do. Why don't you do it? Mm-hmm. You're a grown up. Mm-hmm. It's great. Do it. Yeah. It it feels almost like a precursor to the books by what's his name? The 
I thought Jordan gonna, Peterson. Oh, I oh. thought you were going to say the Shia LaBeouf meme. Of <laughs> Just <laughs> do it! <laughs> do it! Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> cool. Awesome. Well, this has been Classical Stuff You Should Know with Graham, Thomas, and AJ. And you guys know what to do. Do it. Do <laughs> it. This is, yeah. uh, you can find us at Support Classical us on Patreon. Stuff. Hit that, hit that like yeah. and subscribe. Yeah. Yeah. Hit that like and subscribe. <laughs> um, Hopefully, this, this podcast has, uh, as an external stimulus, has affected you emotionally. Uh, and if it has, you should feel ashamed of that. Um, <laughs> but if you want to terrible. email us, you can email us at theguys at classicalstuff.net or you can tweet at us at classical stuff on the twits, uh, spelt wrong, or um, you can... <laughs> I spelled it wrong. Oh, there's classical, classical stuff, stuff already was taken. Already taken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, we thank you for listening. And also, you can maybe, if you want, leave a little review on iTunes. It helps us out. And, uh, a five-star review. Can we I'll clarify? <laughs> hey, if you think no, no. we're three or four, that's fine. No, no. I know. Well, we can take it. I don't need, I don't need to. Because you're not impacted by that. That's right. I'm not impacted exactly by these right. things. <laughs> you're a good story. It's someone else's opinion. If they knew all the other problems the podcast has, then. Yeah, then exactly. One star at least, right? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um, but thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next week. Ciao. Bye. Ciao. Ciao.